670 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. Six minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. This morning, there was a, a photograph in the news. And it was a photograph taken from one of our recently launched satellites. And the reason it was in the news is because the satellite had some cooling problems. And so scientists were a little concerned that maybe it wouldn't be able to do what it was sent up there to do. Which I think, among other things, was to take pictures of stuff. Um, but apparently it works pretty good taking pictures of light. I guess the only problem is that it's going to have a hard time taking pictures of things that are infrared. So it took this beautiful snapshot of planet Earth. Mm-hmm. We've all seen snapshots of planet Earth in this day and age. We've had a lot of them. But I looked at that picture for a moment, and I'm putting the news together, and I'm thinking to myself, boy, if I was like an alien... And I saw this planet. I was like, oh, my gosh, that is a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. I want to live there. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, the world and the earth are really two different things, aren't they? The earth is beautiful. The world, not so much, Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. I mean, there's so much going on in the world that is just questionable. and, And yet, you know, we all live in our own little worlds. And sometimes our own little worlds are beautiful. But turn on the news and you wonder about the world, right? So there is a book that really... It's an amazing coincidence that we have it on today after that. It's kind of profound for me anyway, uh, kind of a thought. Dr. Gordon Marino is on the phone. He's a professor of philosophy. He's the director of the Hong Kong, oh my gosh, Kier- Hong Kong, Hong Kierkegaard. There you go. He pronounced it for me, Kierkegaard <laughs> Library. He's on the phone, obviously, right there. And he said he used to live in Mikinope to you, right? Yeah, that's so that's cool. Right, yeah, yeah. Wow. Good morning, Dr. Yeah, I miss it. How are you? Good, good morning. This is Larry, right? Yeah, my name is Larry. Where, where are you? Where are you calling from? Oh, man, I'm in Minnesota. <laughs> how, how? I, live in, I live in Minnesota. I was a bad kid. Oh, I should I was a bad kid till God sent me out here. <laughs> <laughs> from Micanopy to Minnesota. Did you, did you teach no, it? Did you I grew te- up in the Jersey. I grew up in the Jersey Shore. I just miss the ocean. Oh, <laughs> I bet you do. Yeah, I yeah, always, yeah. I always miss the ocean when I'm not near it. Do you, do you, uh, did you teach at the University of Florida? Yeah, I taught there for one year in 2006. Loved oh. It, yeah. Oh wow! Nice. Can you help me out with the word? I don't know what the word existentialist actually means. What does that mean? Well, it's an existential. Well, an existentialist threat would be a, a kind of ex- a threat to your very being and everything, right? To the core of your being. So, but the movement existentialism that refers to a, a bunch of authors who, uh, with similar themes of, that focus on the individual, freedom, choice. Uh, they're somewhat uh, suspicious of our ability to solve everything with reason. They emphasize passion. So uh, the collection of themes. Okay. So now the subtitle, the Existentialist Survival Guide, the subtitle is How to Live Authentically in an Inauthentic Age. And it also says that this is your memoir. Well, I wouldn't call it my memoir, but there's a lot of uh, memoir in there because I try to uh, uh, to uh, attach various stories, life stories, to the, to the uh, lessons I've gleaned from the existentialists. So... I and, think that makes it more real. All right. I'm, I'm so anxious to hear the details. Now, did you move to Minnesota as a, a way to survive, so to speak? <laughs> <laughs> no, jobs at uh, teaching, philo- teaching philosophy uh, and teaching especially about Kierkegaard, uh, there are not too many of them. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what the is, job market's not great for Kierkegaard College. No, but it's a, I'm at St. Olaf College. It's a wonderful college. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so tell me about your experiences. and Like, what have you learned? Like, your work as a philosopher, does mm-hmm. your ability to uh, pass on to us what we need to know, or what, what you've gleaned, gleaned, is that the word I'm looking for, Robin? Yeah, that's a good word. That's it. Is, okay, so is that from school or is that from life? Well, I'd like to think they're both. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. I, I really approach philosophy as a, philosophy is a love of wisdom, not knowledge. And it's a, if it doesn't make you a better person, it doesn't improve your life, then uh, you're wasting your time. So it's not a matter of working out these intellectual puzzles for me. It's a matter of garnering wisdom. Well, and, and right, uh, right, and you have to be able to apply it. You can't just have it. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's uh, right. And, and that was one of the ideas of my book, Larry and uh, Robin, uh, and. Uh, uh, it was that I've been hanging out with these 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 writers for 30 years, and I ought to be able to distill some 
uh, wisdom from him. So I tried to I tried to do that in the book to say, hey, you know, I've learned this from from Kierkegaard. I've learned this from Dostoevsky. Uh, one of the disturbing factions of life is a suicide, and you uh, point out the question: Is life worth living? I mean, it just really disturbs me when I hear about a person that has mm-hmm. committed suicide and how selfish I feel they have been by doing that. Yeah, and well, it's also not a victimless crime in the sense that so many people imitate. Suicide seems to run in family, and I think that's families because of the imitation. And uh, there's a beautiful, beautiful book called uh, Stay by Diana Hecht, I think it is. And, and she argues, and I think it's a great title, Stay, you know, even if you're in a tor- terrible pain, Stay, uh, because... Uh, suicide people tend to imitate suicide so when we look at the earth from outer space uh, here we go again with your yeah. I didn't know where you were going with that one now wait a minute now wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought wait I might have been on the I thought I might have been on the wrong show <laughs> <laughs> Talking yeah. about satellites and, 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 and I, I feel I was wondering how we're going to get to existentialism <laughs> 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 okay, but but if I were to come down to Earth and never having, let's say I never lived here, if I could create a kind of a, an unrealistic uh, scenario, but let's say I'm, I'm here for the first time, the things that might get to me or confuse me are jealousy, I might be confused by ego, I don't know, I mean, it seems like some of the things that are easy to recognize are not so easy to avoid. That's, that's a good point, Larry. And then that, I think that's a lot of what my book is about, is uh, in order to be a good person, we've got to deal with a lot of difficult emotions, uh, anxiety, depression, a lot of us. Uh, uh, I wrote a piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago on the upside of envy. So we have this relationship to our emotions, and that's a lot of what I talk about in the book, is what's the best way to think about them. So you know, today, it's pretty much a, the, most of the thought is, well, give me a pill or maybe uh, some... Uh, seven steps to getting rid of uh, anxiety, something like that. Uh, give me a pillar of method. Do There's we, a certain kind of level of reflection that we're not uh, inclined to go into. In one way, social media makes me think we make it worse because everybody's tr- putting themselves on f- social media for the most part, making themselves look like they're having a grand old time. And, and I you- love that. Right? <laughs> oh, I'm on the beach! You know, and then you're supposed to write, I'm jealous! Yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't stand that. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Man. But on the other hand, I think I wonder if it doesn't help because it takes the celebrity and and makes them a real person. In other words, the the, the, the famous people of our world are really no different than us. Are what? Are, yeah, I don't think so. I, I still think celebrities are like secular saints in our society. Uh-huh. We're... we're, we're, we're uh, fixated on them. And uh, as for social media, I, ju- I, I don't think it's doing a lot of great things for our capacity for intimacy, for being close together, to being close to one another. And uh, I do think it's good for people that are, are, are sick or that, are, that are can't get out. I mean, it, it, is an, it is a way into the world for them, which I think is wonderful, but it has a, it has a downside, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, since you are a boxing coach and an award-winning boxing writer, uh, do people come to you to learn how to box because they have this anger that they have to get out and they don't know how to deal with it except being physical in, in a safe way? Well, it's not just, just anger. It's anxiety. It is. There's anger and, and, and fear. Those are two very elemental uh, emotions, and uh, we don't have many workshops for them in life, and uh, they come up. I mean, for example, we're... Kids are cosseted from or are protected from fearful situations all the time today. So, if we're going to be brave and good people, we need to deal with those emotions, and I think they can be very helpful. Uh, boxing can be very helpful, and if it's in the right, you're in the right gym with the right coach, and it's uh, supervised properly. And I've seen it do do wonders. And, and also, um, there's a, there's a lot of kids that never never get never get any love. They have a, in bad homes. Uh, you know, things are screaming and fighting at home. If there's and then they go to school, they're angry, they get in trouble, so they never hear a positive word. And uh, sometimes they come to the gym and they find a community there and, the, and something they're good at, and all of a sudden they get this affirmation, which we all need, and they blossom. So uh, for some kids, it's just amazing, does amazing things. Oh, I think, yeah, what you said is... is we all need love, you know, we all need affirmation, and it's, there's a bunch of people in the world who never get, never said, nobody ever says you're good, you're really good at this, you know what I mean? They just never... Oh, I know. I, and, and that's poison, man. Uh, absolutely, and, and I, I think that we had a, a guest on earlier this morning, he called in from Germany, and he mm-hmm. was saying one of the biggest problems, he's a musician, one of the biggest problems is when he posts, he's, he's reluctant, he didn't even want me to put his face on the podcast, which I didn't. Mm-hmm. Because I couldn't find it anywhere, but he was—he he doesn't want people to 
write bad reviews because he it makes him feel bad for days on end. And yeah. I, and yeah. I feel, well, that's pro that's the way the world is. It's crazy. I said, don't listen to him, but that's the way it is. That is that is something I have learned. I was I've been a boxing writer for about about twenty. You know, it's about twenty years, and uh, you would not uh, when you, when you write a column, you would not, or you blog a fight, you wouldn't believe the comments that you get sometimes. I mean, they're just like racist stuff, all kinds of nasty. So there's a level of anger there. It's simmering below the surface, obviously, you know. But it's really a window into a oh yeah uh, uh, some bad stuff. You yeah, know, and, uh, yeah. It just takes a little bit of a. Yeah, and we get a lot of that on, on, on the in social media, right? The bullying that goes on with it. So boxing is is a form of therapy. Is we have in, in our community, uh, as you know, having lived here, a, a lot of horse farms, and and there yeah. are there are at least two therapeutic riding groups that I know of that help autistic children or yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah, and it, and the stories we hear are amazing how uh, one for example a, a boy who wouldn't speak and then he started having a relationship with the horse and with the you know, horse, yeah. next yeah. thing you know he's talking so that i mean t to me that almost is a, a way to survive is to get something else connection some connection connection thank you and and from from the dogs and the horses i suppose although i'm a little afraid of them this to get unconditional love and this uh they don't they don't want to see uh uh, what do you, what's your what's your grade point average, or what did you publish lately, or how much you're making? Right, right. There's unconditional love there. Right, absolutely. And it's so healing. But uh, but there's a lot of kids. I mean, but we also need just affirmation. You know, the people to tell us and when you when you when you are doing something good that you're good. And there's so many people that don't get any of that. Do you, do you know if if I could share something with you that works for me, like when I'm feeling bummed out, if if mm -hmm. I if I watch like a dog video on YouTube or something like that, just <laughs> I, I don't know, it really helps me. I just I just think the the world isn't so bad if there's a dog chasing his tail, you know? <laughs> yeah. And the uh, way you have written your book, sir, it is not a textbook. You have real life no. scenarios in there. You pose questions that people should reflect on because in some of those stories they might see themselves. They they might use those as a mirror. Yeah, thanks so much for saying that. It's true. Yeah, uh, that, that was the that was the fun part and sometimes difficult part of the book because most of the stories aren't exactly uh, pleasant ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Earlier <laughs> in the year, I had one of my students uh, say, oh, "I'm going to get that book for Valentine's Day for my uh, for my sweetheart," and I said, "Well, you know, the first three chapters are anxiety, depression, and death. I think you better pick another book for Valentine's Day." <laughs> I uh, no, like the, I, I like the fact you like Bob Dylan. I love him. He's been a teacher. He's a teacher. Mm -hmm. I don't like the way he acts a lot of time, though. I don't like the way he acts, but I, I've gotten a lot of my news from him. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, the way he writes. <laughs> what he writes. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't like the way he dealt with the Nobel Prize situation. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so tell me about religion. What What are your thoughts on religion? Read me one of my thoughts. Why don't you man, can you ask a little broader question? <laughs> Uh, all right, let me ask it a different way then. Um, all right. No, 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 let me ask What it. are your thoughts on religion? All right. Okay. okay, yeah, you're right. No, you're right. That was too broad of a question. What, I'm a broad. What are, okay, what is your thought on this? Two men are, are completely opposite. One believes, right. one believes in God, and one has faith in God in order to uh, get through the day. The other doesn't believe in God and says, I don't need faith in God. I have logic to get me through the day. And the two of them are not going to ever be friends because of this difference. And, me and meanwhile, at the same time, mm -hmm. they both agree that you should treat one another nice. They both agree that you should be generous with your money. And you know what I mean? What, what, what do you say to... Th okay, there's my question that's more specific about religion. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't a question. That was a statement. Yeah, my, <laughs> what, no, but the question is, what is your thought? <laughs> what would you yeah, say? No, okay, so two, two people that are acting pretty much... Uh, no, what that would you say to pretty them? much the same, and then uh, but one believes and one doesn't. I don't have a lot. To, I, I don't. I don't think there's one of the things I've garnered from Kierkegaard is that I, I don't think there's a lot of arguments for for for, for, for trying to trust in God, and that's what I call faith: the trust, trying to trying to trust in God. Uh, so I, I wouldn't. No, I'm sure there's plenty of decent human beings that that uh, are. are no, but believe, if, God is de believe God is dead. So I'm not sure what I'd say to that, but I don't think you're going to get along on logical. I don't think you're going to lead an upright and loving life just on the basis of logic, okay, you know, on reason. Okay. You know, so I'm I'm a little skeptical of that idea and the and the notion that reason is some capacity that's not a in any way attached to our emotions. We have such a capacity for rationalization and 
self-deception. It's amazing. Okay, you know, but I mean, as far as surviving, that, that's what your book is about, right? So surviving, uh, let's say in a family situation mm. where um, you're, you're going to you're going to hang out with your family for Thanksgiving and you're going to run into people who disagree with you, um, and and in, and in fact might even become angry with you because they disagree with you. What? Yeah. How do you survive that? That's maybe a better question. No, it's not a better question. You got to clarify that. What do you mean? You so you have Thanksgiving dinner with people who, who disagree with you? What do you do? With loved ones who disagree with you? <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. All right. We're sparring now. We're oh. sparring now, baby. You're sparring. We're sparring. Yeah, okay. you are. You are no. sparring with me a little bit. All right. All right. So, so. No, I thought I want to spar. We got to clarify. Okay. So, yeah, but you're right. There, there are a lot of situations today in the political climate where people so vehemently disagree with one another that it's hard to. Even respect one another. I, I know that's true. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. Okay, maybe religion is throwing you off. Well, I, I'm well just, there is one point, important point in the book that I, I mean, no, one important point. That's a great, great, great review. <laughs> 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 there is one point in the book that I think is, is important about religion, and that's I, I try to distinguish between people who claim they've lost their faith and pushing it away. And my, my argument is that we don't lose it; we push it away. So. Uh, Okay. If I if I don't feel trust in God, don't believe in God, whatever, I can either decide to pray and hope for hope for hope to have that that, that faith, or I can just say, well, that's it, you know. All right. And a lot of and a lot of people think that they they've lost their faith when in fact they really just pushed it away. Yeah. They don't, don't want to they don't want to try anymore for it. They don't pray. So the question is, when you don't have faith, do you pray for faith or do you or do you say that's it? <laughs> no, that's a really good one. Uh, yeah. So, but as far as surviving, I'm trying to think of relationships that you want to preserve, and, yeah. and how disagreement can sometimes be the flame that burns up a relationship. Oh, yeah. um, and and if you're disagreeing about religion, and maybe a religion right. made it too hard to answer, what if it was about raising children? What if it was mm. about money? Uh, what is the what is the Advice you would give somebody to survive that, because you, if you want to preserve the relationship, whether it's a marriage or I don't know, or jo a job, maybe even maybe in a workplace. Well, I certainly want to look for common ground and, uh, and a kind of tenderness to reach across to realize we're all, uh, you know, we all come from different places, and uh, to recognize the differences between people and, and to try to, to bridge that gap. But, but there's also times when disagreements can can, can become. So, uh, such, such a chasm that it's difficult to maintain a relationship. I can also see that. You think that uh, people run too much for medication and not enough just, you know, just trying to open up and really get to the bottom of what their problems are? Yeah, right. Good. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm certainly not saying that people shouldn't take medication, but I do think we uh, run to the medicine cabinet pretty quickly these days. And, uh, the more we to to mollify anxiety or depression, and uh, we're the most medicated country in the world. I think one in six people are on psychotropic drugs. Drugs, and I think to some extent, the more we rely on that, the less capable we are of, of being able to sit with certain emotions that are part of life and, and difficult, and also have a, have lessons to teach. I mean, for example, uh, I, I lean on Kierkegaard to argue that you know it's that anxiety that we. Really understand that we're these free human beings that have respons you know, free who have this freedom and responsibility. And so anxiety has something to teach us. And that, that's one of the things I, I, I find with boxing is uh, uh, with, with kids of amateurs and professionals who compete, this ability to um, to sit with anxiety, to, to not be panicked about feeling panicked, basically, to not be. Uh, so I think we need probably more practice with those emotions, and sometimes the medication. It just dulls us and we get less and less able to deal with feelings. Uh, our guest is Dr. Gordon Marino. His book is called The Existentialist's Survival Guide, How to Live Authentically in an Inauthentic Age. When, when I read the, uh, the subtitle there, I, I imagined that the inauthentic age was manifesting itself today with the social media because that, to me, whilst many people may be authentic, I think there's a lot of inauthenticity there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's so much concern with self-presentation, selfies, and yeah. how you present yourself. That's what I try to talk about in the, in the chapter on love: is uh, how hard it is to be to be 
except being loved for who you are, not who you present yourself to be, not who you're, you know, idealized self. But the, the, the real intimacy, real love involves being, you know, accepting your, being accepted for who you are. I, I can't tell you yeah. how often this happens to me where I'll be talking to somebody or reading about somebody, and I'll say, gosh, what a phony. And, and mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's just my way of, of kind mm-hmm. of dismissing whatever it is they're trying to pull off because I just don't believe it. But then I look in the mirror. And I wonder mm-hmm. how often am I inauthentic with my own self? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we got we, we have to catch ourselves in those situations and uh, just you know, give, <laughs> slap ourselves in the head a little bit and wake up. You know, yeah. oh, yeah. this is just part of the words to be human. We want to be admired. We want to be uh, loved. But uh, but I think it's really important to be able to be a, accept love for who you are. You have somebody from people who really know you, and uh, that's a really hard thing. Well, and, and a great example I can think of, and I hope it's in line with what you're saying, is is the the uh, the guy who heard the Beatles when he was younger and wanted to be the Beatles, and he's still playing in bars, and he still believes that he's going to be the Beatles one day, and he's now <laughs> 60, 70 years old. I, I, I can't tell you how many musicians I know, and they're great musicians, but for one reason or another, the world just didn't come together. For, they're, they're imagined. Oh, that's right. Right? right? That, that's absolutely right. I mean, like, there's... <laughs> Fortune, success, and so there's so many contingencies. But that, that's why I really encourage uh, my students not to just think about what they want to do, but what kind of people they want to be. And that's something we don't think about that often in this society. Yeah. And I feel that millennials are college students. They're, they're at an age when they're, they're, they can try to what kind of you ask themselves, what kind of human being do I want to be? Right. Some, you know, and that, that's something we have some control over. And uh, But you're right, the, 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 the success and well. Uh, and, uh, there's so many contingencies here. And, and if yeah. I could bring my faith in God into this part of this conversation, I believe this. I, I believe that you and I have been gifted by God to do something. There is some kind of a mission that we're supposed to do, whether it's radio or writing books or, or spreading philosophy or anything. And, and I think if you are barking up the wrong tree, God's not going to let it happen for you. If you want to mm-hmm. be the next Michael Jackson, you maybe God wants you to be the next mechanic. You know? that could, that could be. That could be. Yeah, I don't think of it so much in vocation. I think of what God wants us to be is the Good Samaritan. I always go to the Good Samaritan story. It's my favorite. You know, That's, I mean, I love that one too. Know, yeah, yeah. You know, it's so important. Like it's almost like God said, you know, uh, love your neighbor. And then the Pharisees ask him, you know, well, who's my neighbor? And uh, tells a story. And and I think that's the that's for me that's a real model of. Uh, 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 what we what, what we shame at and being a human being, and also the Peter story, the denial of Christ and the Peter story. I think oh. that's the most amazing story in the Bible, man. The guy, the guy denies me Peter too. Denies Christ oh. three times, yes, right? yes, three times, and you could, he must have like wanted to go out and do what Judas did, you know. And he goes on, and uh, so this ability to uh-huh. to uh, change to turn make U turns in your life, Absolutely. and to not not to just just hate yourself and just you know endlessly hate yourself for what you've done in the past but to, to repent and right. go on and uh, I think the Peter story is amazing you know, well just, I do too and isn't it interesting that you brought that one up because I always look at the the disciples and I say which I don't think I would do what Judas did I don't think I'd take money and betray my friend but I bet you I would deny knowing him if I was afraid for my life so mm-hmm. I I could easily be Peter you mm-hmm. know yeah me too not in the, yeah. I don't think I could do the good things he did but I think I could I could fall short in that one regard yeah yeah when your life yeah when your life's at stake yeah, yeah. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you know, by the way, if I could squeeze in one Bible story, or two of them <laughs> actually, you know what I never understood? And, and part of your book, you, you, you do explain that it's okay sometimes to wonder. Um, sure it's okay to wonder. Okay, so I always wondered about this. Okay, in the story in the Bible where Jesus is in the boat and he's sleeping, and, yeah. the, and the disciples are worried, here comes a storm, and then Jesus wakes up and goes, what's the matter with you? Yeah. How come you're so worried? Where is your faith? And then, yeah. and then, okay, and they feel bad. Oh my gosh! Yeah, we shouldn't. Have. Now the night in Gethsemane, right? Right. Who's sleeping? The disciples. Who's awake? Yeah. Who's worried? Jesus, right? And now he reprimands them for not being worried. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you can't win? <laughs> no. You can't win. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think the Gethsemane story is so much about that, that Jesus, as a, human, as a as a human, had to go through death and feel yeah. fearful. Yeah. You know, how terrifying it is! Even it was even for Jesus. He says, "Take this cup." 
Now I'm sort of sound like the preacher, but <laughs> but it's true though. But it, but it's uh, uh, you know he he too had to go through the terror of of death into that nothingness and uh, and was afraid. I wish we could talk every day. I'm enjoying this. I, I, mean, I you, guys, you guys are fun to talk. To. I even enjoy the even your satellite stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I even enjoy the sparring. By the way, that that yeah. was that was good stuff. All right, uh, Doctor Gordon Marino, thank you so much for being on the air. I, uh, I have a copy of the book that was sent to me, so call me if you want the copy that was sent here. The rest of us have to go buy it. I found it on Amazon, where you're getting great reviews, by the way. Uh, th- thanks so much to both of you. Really a pleasure to talk with you. You're really fun. Uh, th- oh, thank, you, thank you. you. And if, uh, number five right now in the existentialism category. Um, number 145 in the happiness category. 145. <laughs> <laughs> 145 in the happiness. Well, oh, man, you, know, you didn't have to tell me that. <laughs> that's not bad. There's millions of books out there. What do you mean? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank, uh, thanks so much. Thank you. That was fun. All right. We, we'll take a little break. We'll be right back. This, <laughs> this is The Source, WOCA. Gene Powell Pastimoy, 352-629-2440. Our tractor services include bush hog, disc front end loader, box blade, and stump grinding. We also have zero turn mowers for the smaller paddocks, aisleways, fence rows, and lawn care. Fence row spraying is also available for weed control. We are licensed and insured. Gene Powell Pastimon, 352-629-2440 or online at powellgene, G-E-N-E, at yahoo.com. Gene Powell Pastimon. Gene is a proud United States veteran. You are ready to buy that house that fits your needs, but how do you find it? Easy. Call Angie at 352-361-8359. Angie gets with you to get that information you need to buy that house. Angie is more than just an agent with Roberts Real Estate. She's a pro with heart. So you call her at 352-361-8359, and you will know you have the right person. I'm Angie Umpleby, and I'm looking forward to working with you when you call me at 352-361-8359. That's 352-361-8359. Friends, countrymen, tourists, and O'Callens, lend me your ears. Hey, speaking of ears, there is an opportunity for you to help feed and provide good maintenance, housing, and medical care for Marion County's rescued big cats, bears, monkeys, and other disabled or unreleasable wild and exotic animals. Take a tour on Wednesdays or Saturdays of the Endangered Animal Rescue Sanctuary. Adults $20, children 12 and under just $12. Call 352-266-2859 for any questions. Here are today's headlines from the source WOCA. Marion County Sheriff Billy Woods presented a video to the Marion County School Board yesterday recorded on the body cam of School Resource Officer Deputy James Jimmy Long on April 20th at Forest High School immediately after reports of gunfire at the school. The video shows Long running through the halls of the school to address the situation. He inspects several classrooms and then enters the classroom where teacher Kelly McManus Panasuk had been talking to the 19-year-old suspect. Sheriff Woods addressed that situation with the school board and expressed concern that McManus Panasuk should not have opened the door and brought the suspect into her classroom because it put these students in that classroom in extreme danger. Woods also cleared up several rumors that says are false. Specifically, he said the suspect still had a knife on him when he entered the classroom and that he was not disarmed and that he could have killed the teacher and other students in that room. He also said the gun was not an antique firearm and that the suspect did intend to kill and that the suspect was not a kid. Woods emphasized that the suspect at the age of 19 is the same age as those who join law enforcement. Santa Fe College in Gainesville has increased security after 11 animals disappeared from their habitats at the teaching zoo. The college's zoo workers say two gopher tortoises and two box turtles went missing from their open enclosure last Tuesday. A week later, zookeepers discovered another seven animals missing from their secure enclosures, including a squirrel monkey, a skink, two redfoot tortoises, and three box turtles. Zookeepers are worried because some of those animals need medication to survive. Jade Salomon with the Santa Fe Teaching Zoo said, quote, especially at the moment, keepers and staff are feeling extremely emotional. We feel violated. The zoo is a safe haven for our keepers and our animals, unquote. The gopher tortoises are a protected species, making it a third degree felony to harm or tamper with them. 
The city of Clearwater is participating in the Strawless Summer Challenge, asking restaurants and bars not to give out plastic straws unless requested by customers. Recycling specialist Sheridan Boyle has a comment. The kind of incentive for businesses to participate in this challenge is, one, you're doing something great for the environment because plastic straws are kind of a needless item that have a a big effect on our marine ecosystems. But also that um, the city is going to spotlight participating businesses on our social media efforts and our website. Boyle says Americans use around half a billion plastic straws every day, and plastic has been found to be responsible for the deaths of 100,000 marine animals and 1 million seabirds each year. Today is the start of the 2018 hurricane season. Brian Lamar with the National Weather Service in Florida says this season there's better forecasting to help you prepare. Typically a hurricane watch, we're going to be providing that anywhere up to about 48 hours in advance, where it used to be 36 hours. And hurricane warnings used to be about 24 hours, now we're going about 36, so about an extra 12 hours, which can definitely help people plan for evacuations, get out of the area, and get the supplies they need. Forecasters are predicting an average hurricane season with between 10 and 16 named storms and 5 to 9 hurricanes. Florida's top banking regulator is abruptly resigning after clashing with Chief Financial Officer Jimmy Petronas. Drew Brakespear sent his resignation letter in yesterday evening to Governor Rick Scott and the three members of the state cabinet. Brakespear has been the Office of Financial Regulation Commissioner for five years. His last day will be June 30th. Petronas first called for Brakespear's ouster in early May, but refused to say specifically why he wanted him to be removed from his job. He said that he was not responsive and did not cooperate with Florida's financial industry. Politico Florida reported yesterday that public records and emails showed that companies and financial interests complained to Petronas' office after run-ins with Breakspear. Petronas' office also disagreed with Breakspear over how to handle a sexual harassment allegation against one of Breakspear's employees. The family of a Florida man killed by a sheriff's deputy has been awarded four cents by a federal jury. The jury ruled yesterday that 30-year-old Gregory Hill Jr. was 99% responsible for his death because he was drunk and the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office was 1% responsible. T.C. Palm reports the jury awarded Hill's relatives $4, of which they get 1%. Deputy Christopher Newman and his partner went to Hill's home in 2014 for a loud music complaint. After they knocked on the garage and front doors, Hill opened the garage. When the door started back down, Newman fired, killing Hill. An unloaded gun was found in Hill's pocket. Tests showed Hill's blood alcohol content was .40, which is five times the driving limit. A 61-year-old Georgia man has died while snorkeling off a beach that had red flag warnings about rip currents in Florida's panhandle. Rick Carell was found floating face down in the water off Panama City Beach on Wednesday. The Panama City News Herald reports that lifeguards had been trying to keep swimmers out of the water given the presence of riptides in the wake of subtropical storm Alberto. Double red flags were flying to indicate that swimming was prohibited. Lifeguards had to make multiple rescues because of the rip currents on Wednesday. As the new hurricane season begins today, people will notice some changes have been made in various counties. In Sarasota County, one change comes with the help of Florida's former Master of Disaster, Craig Fugit. Well, Sarasota County, after Irma did an after-action report, they asked me to come in and and help them. And one of the things they had done is they'd set up a couple of pet-friendly shelters. And when everybody started evacuating, what it turned out happened was they ended up having to take pets at all the shelters. So, Part of the recommendation which Sarasota County is implementing is all of their shelters are going to be pet friendly. He says everybody reached the conclusion that it was a sensible idea, so they're ready with implementation for this hurricane.